let's now start with um, going over some points. So let's start number one. I just want to share one thing from last week. We discussed the idea that a rasha, a person who is, we're going back to witnesses for a moment, a person who is wicked is unable to testify. So if, what does it mean he's wicked? He did a biblical prohibition. Even if he wasn't warned by witnesses, the mere fact of him doing something which would have been a biblical prohibition, like let's say he shaves with a razor. That's a biblical prohibition. Even if, you know, he didn't get two witnesses to warn him and say, you're not allowed to do that, that's a biblical prohibition. And believe it or not, according to the Tzemach Tzedek, even if you use an electric shaver, it's a biblical prohibition, a different biblical prohibition. Unless the person knew that the Tzemach Tzedek would ask for such an electric shaver, maybe they wouldn't be invalidated after the fact. Because the Alter Rebbe went on to say that if somebody does a biblical prohibition, but they don't know that it's forbidden, then we can't invalidate them as a witness. Okay, so the question that, but that's, a, that's an interesting discussion we had a little bit last week. Now I'm gonna go on to the following discussion, which is, why is a person who is a Russia wicked, what makes them become invalid as a, as a, as a witness? So there is an interesting um, safer, two set volumes from, from the Rebbe, and it was a commentary, or Biurim Sichot uh, talks on, the, on the, the Rambam. So in their volume two, page 552, called Yayin Machus, in Machus. So the Rebbe brings from the Ragachavar Gon, who wrote a sefer on the Rambam called the Tzachnes Paneach. And over there he explains, the Ragachavar explains that the reason why a wicked person cannot serve as a witness, whether it's for Ketuba, whether it's to be a witness of a Ketuba or a Get, or maybe a witness for a loan, or in there, any type of testimony, technically, the reason why they cannot serve as a witness, so why is it? Is it because we're afraid they're gonna lie? Or is it because they're just invalid because the Torah decrees so? So first of all, there's a Pasuk which says, don't place your hand with the Russia to be an uh, inspiring witness. Al tashis yadchem Russia liyoseid Hamas, it says which we learned from there that if you know your friend is a Russia, you're not allowed to testify with him, even if you know that you're saying true testimony. The mere fact that he became a Russia because he ate non-kosher, he ate uh, basar v'chalav, and it was cooked what together. What about Russia, David? Huh? A guy lies and cheats for your money? Is that a Russia? What's a Russia? He ate a cheeseburger cooked together, he becomes a Russia according to the Torah, even though that nobody lies and steals money from you? Is nobody he a Russia? Uh, Nobody officially had uh, warned him about it. So that's why Rabbi Reichik in last week was, I asked him, I said, what about a lot of Valet Chuvo who have very good intentions, but they might be doing a lot of biblical prohibitions without knowing that they're doing biblical prohibitions. And actually the Alter Rebbe himself says that the only way you could be lenient on somebody who was, was a witness after the fact and they did biblical prohibitions is if you're certain that they didn't know that they was prohibited. So most people don't know that tying a knot on Shabbos, a lot of people sincerely don't know that if you make a double knot on Shabbos, it's a biblical prohibition. They might not know that that would invalidate them to serve as a witness for a ketubah or a wedding. It would be that the woman didn't get married at the end if one of them is tying double knots on his shoes on Shabbos. But if you know that he doesn't know that it's prohibited, you could be lenient after the fact and make him a, a valid witness. So a lot, of, a lot of people don't necessarily know all of the halachas, what are prohibited and what are not. That enough. could be, you know, that would be leniency if need be. If but generally speaking, enough. you try to look for witnesses who, who are sincere, they know, and, and they also learn. They learn so they know what is not allowed and they, they actually have to keep by it, you know. Okay, whatever, another talk, topic of its own. So the Rebbe says that, that the problem of a, a witness who is wicked is because he the Torah decrees that you can't take his testimony, even if he's saying the truth. There's a Gemara in Baba Metziah which says like this, let's say a guy is choshed al davar echad. He's, he's known that he's very kale das. He's very not careful when it comes to, uh, you know, eating non-kosher. He has, he, he unfortunately is very not careful about non-kosher. Does that mean that you can't trust him on some other matter? Or let's say he's very, he, he, he can't hold himself back. He always has to shave his beard with a razor. He, he feels he just needs to do it. 
Could you trust them if they asked him, is this meat kosher? He'll say, yes, it was the kosher one or it's not. So there is a rule that if a person generally is from, but they have a very big Yetzirah or one specific thing, you can listen to what they have to say on other matters. Now, it doesn't mean you could use them as a witness necessarily, but uh, after the fact, for certain things, you can ask them what, what, what happened and they'll tell you or so. For certain things, not for everything. So, but, and the Gemara says that that's, that works. But yet, if a person is still a Russia, you're not allowed to let them testify. So the Rebbe says that's a proof that it's not because we don't necessarily believe them. Even if they were testifying not to their favor or not to their fa friend's favor, you still are not allowed to believe them. So you said the Rebbe Shavar says, and the Rebbe quotes this, that the problem of accepting testimony from a Russia is because intrinsically it's not, not accepted by the Torah. And even if, even if, otherwise we would believe it. Okay, now we're going to move on to subsection 10. Before we start subsection 10, there is a Gemara that I want to go over with you, an important Gemara. And when we understand this Gemara, which is a little short quotation I brought from Baba Basra, the whole subsection of the Alter Rebbe will be very easy to understand. The Gemara in Bava Basra on 40a says the following. Hodas bifnei shnayim. Hoda bifnei shnayim. Ritzarach lomer kisvu. And you have to say kisvu. It means like this. If you admit that you owe money to someone in front of two witnesses, right? So we say, do we accept that he admitted in front of them or we don't accept? Is it enough that he says, I owe money, I owe $100,000 to Shimon, and two people heard it? Is that considered they should write it down and make it like a contract? Do they actually have to see the giving of $200,000 of a loan? Or is it enough he just admitted in front of them? So Gemara says, if he admitted in front of two witnesses, it could be enough, but the person needs to say to the witnesses, go ahead and write it down. Because if he doesn't say, write it down, then it's only considered a verbal loan. We will see in a moment in the Alter Rebbe what is the difference if it's just a verbal loan or a written loan. Okay? Then the Gemara says, Kinyan bifnei shnayim, acquisition by means of a symbolic act, utilizing a cloth, picking up an item or so. As you, you know, there's a thing called Kinyan Sudar, which is something like this. You see, sometimes you go to a wedding, you see this guy lift up a handkerchief or something, or, or something like that. So that's called a Kinyan. We'll, we'll discuss that uh, soon. So the Gemara says, Kinyan bifnei shnayim ve'enei tzarech lamar kasvu. If a person made it a acquiring, so a guy says, I'm selling you my field. I'm selling my field to Shimon. And in order to make that this will be uh, effective, here we're making a Kinyan for the, uh, an acquisition that the witnesses should see. So if the witnesses see the sale plus a kinyan, then they not the the seller or or the, the buyer what he does not need to say go ahead and write it down even if he doesn't say the witnesses can automatically assume that they can write it down the reason is because when the moment you make a kinyan in front of uh, you make an acquire an acquisition in front of two witnesses it's stipulated in, that it's a given rule that it's automatically intended to be a, 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 a acquisition, that it automatically should be written as a contract. You know, you'll say, what does it make a difference if it should be written down or not? We're going to see in a moment. We're going to see in a moment what the difference is. And then the Gemara finally says, the Kiyom Shtar Spishlosh, if you uh, want to uh, rat ratification of legal documents, meaning that you say the document is going to be considered confirmed right now, so then you need to have three people. That means that if, let's say, there was a based in who says, oh, you want to prove to us that this document is, le is real, bring the two witnesses, have them testify that this is the, uh, the, the, the signatures of both of the witnesses, they'll testify, and then we will, on the bottom, authorize it. We'll, like, oh, as if to say, notarize it, make it like it's an official um, document that is acceptable, that even if the witnesses will pass away or, or move on, we know that the, the document is still good. So the Gemara says, basically, when you admit in front of two people, it's not enough to make them write down the contract unless the person involved in indebting himself will say, write it down. When we're talking about making, uh, if they do a Kenyan on the same transaction and they did a tra uh, an acquisition, then um, even if you don't say write it down, the witnesses can automatically write it down. And when it comes to fulfillment or ratification of legal documents, it should always be done not in front of two people, 
but the two, two witnesses should testify in front of three people. Okay, fine. Now we move on. And now in, C, in subsection 10, the Alter Rebbe goes discussing the topic of how um, when you make a contract, sorry, when you make a loan to somebody, can the witnesses who observed the matter write it down or not? So now let's read what I wrote here as the introduction. Here's the introduction. A documented loan has extra strength over a loan supported by an oral commitment. So what does that mean? There's, there's a documented loan, which means I owe Ruve money. I owe him $10,000 that I borrowed from in the city of Los Angeles on the date of uh, the 12th of, uh, the 12th of Menachem Av in this, you know, on the year 5780. And, uh, and I will pay it back hopefully within six months or so. And then he signs on it and then two witnesses sign on the bottom of it. So that's called a documented uh, loan. That's very strong. That means that if, the, the lender will show that loan to anyone, will assume, hey, this is proof that the loan took place and you have to pay it back. Okay, now what is the um, oral loan, a loan supported by oral commitment? It's like this, you say, I give a loan of 10,000, same exact scenario, I gave $10,000 loan to Shimon and I didn't have anything written down, I should have, and Alter Rebbe in the laws of um, document uh, loans says how, it, how important it is and it's almost a biblical prohibition if you make a loan without documenting it because then what could happen people will forget or they'll deny it or very big problems could incur so it's always important to document your loans but if you didn't then it was only a so if you have witnesses watching it so it's a okay they can testify the problem with them is is that you know what if they're not there to testify and then there's also some other problems as we're going to see right now no so so now the advantage of a documented loan is it has extra strength over a loan supported by an oral commitment. Why? In that a lien, you know what a lien is? A lien is that if, I, if somebody gets money in the future, I can collect any money that comes into them because they anyways owe me. So I have this document, which is, in, is a lien on all their properties. So the, so the document in loan is that a lien is established by the lender on all manifest, prop, uh, on all properties sold or given as a gift by the borrower from the time of the loan. So very simple. I gave a loan today, a written documented loan today on the 12th of Menachem Av, 5780, to Shimon for $10,000. Later on, and you know, he's supposed to pay me in 30 days, but whatever. So now later on, I see him and he didn't pay me back yet. And I find out that, a, that after the loan, about 30 days after the loan, he sold his car for $10,000. I didn't know that he had a car, but he sold it. So I'm allowed to go over to the buyer and say, whoa, 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 whoa. he's not paying me my money. And this, this um, car that he sold you for $10,000, he had no right to sell it to you. He had to pay me back my loan first. So I'm going to take away this car from you and use it to pay back my loan. If you have any problems, go back to the person who sold it to you. He should have never sold you the car without uh, letting you know that he owes people money. So when am I able, when am I the lender able to do that if I have a documented loan? Because then my documented loan will manifest, lo um, will, will, will manifest a lien over all assets that are either given as a gift or sold from the time of the loan. Now, what if it would have been an oral loan? So an oral loan doesn't have that koach. It doesn't have that strength. It, 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 yes, I'm able to collect and I can demand him to pay me if he has the money. But if he had already, after the fact, had sold something, which he could have used to pay back his loan, or he gave it as a gift, after the fact, it's too late, I can't demand them to pay. Now, what is the real difference between if it was documented or it was an oral loan? Very simple. This is all in the Gemara, in the, the Rishonim explaining. Because a documented loan has a very large voice. It has in Halacha called a kol, a voice. So when people make a loan with a, with a, a documented loan, People are supposed to know about it. And they go, whoa, are you sure you want to buy that used car from Shimon? I understand that he, he borrowed money from Ruven a month ago and it was with a loan and it was documented. You know, who knows? Maybe if he's not going to pay back his loan, he's going to come after you. He's like, no, 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 okay, I'm not buying any car from this guy. I want to buy a car from someone who I see he has no creditors trying to get money from him. He, he doesn't owe any money to any banks or anybody. So that, that is the reason the Rishon explained why a documented loan has more strength. There's another advantage to a documented loan. 
that the documented loan, if I um, say, you know, okay, well, let's start the opposite. By a non-documented loan, if he says, I paid you back, he would generally be believed. Whereas by a documented loan, we won't believe him unless he brings proof because he's, the, the lender could say, oh, you paid me back? So, okay, well, here's my document that you didn't pay me back. Because normally when you pay back a loan, you take back the, the IOU. Why would you pay me back and not take back the IOU? So this is a proof, you didn't pay me back. So for obvious reasons, it's Im important that a lender should make a, a documented um, um, lent, low, um, uh, promissory note. It's clear. But what if there was a, here's our question that the Alter Rebbe now does. This is the introduction to Sifiyot. Now the Alter Rebbe says, what happens when you, you lent money to Shimon in front of two witnesses? You don't have to have the borrower sign on the document. Yes, I borrowed. No, it would be enough if the, the, you know, it's better that he should sign on the document, but it would also be enough if the document says like this, I, Reuven, lent money to Shimon uh, in this and this place, on this and this and date, with this currency, etc., and you should pay me back uh, within 30 days. And this is a proof that he didn't pay me, as long as I have this document, it's not a proof he didn't pay me back. And then he has two witnesses signed on the bottom. That's it, that's, an, that's, that's enough, that's a valid contract. Okay, so the question would be, and al here is discussing this, if the witnesses saw the, the loan take place, can they then write up the contract after the fact or not? So the, the, the borrower is not going to sign in this contract. Will it be effective? So al says in subsection 10, he teaches us that an oral loan that took place in front of witnesses, the witnesses may not write down their testimony and give it to the lender without the consent of the borrower. Why not? For perhaps he would not have agreed to draft such a document. He'd say, hey, I don't agree to this. I don't want you making a written document on me. I know if I have an oral document, I can, I can beat the system. I can play around. You know, I can say, I, I can sell stuff even when I'm not paying you back. I can give loans. I mean, I can give gifts. But if you are documented our loan, I can't do that stuff. Or, or, or you, I know that you can collect from them. I don't want that. Or, you know, so, so the borrower might not want a documented loan. Now, you know, the, the lender can demand it. But if he had already done it without the, lend, without the borrower consenting to it or signing on it, so if it just was an oral loan in front of two witnesses, if the borrower did not say, yes, I give you permission to write, write it, this down after I leave and make a documented, then they're not allowed to do so. Isn't that interesting? Now, the Alter Rebbe then goes on in subsection 10 to say, but what if there was a Kenyan Sudar? Ah, oh, this reminds us of the Gemara we've just discussed in Bava Basra. A Kenyan Sudar, as we mentioned, is something like this interesting concept where a guy lifts up a handkerchief. It doesn't have to be a handkerchief. If it's a handkerchief, it, just, it really just has to be a complete garment. Really, it should be at least a garment of three fingers by three fingers. Not that big. A complete handkerchief, let's say. Or even a gartel. A gartel would also work. So... If he picks up a, uh, uh, um, a, a, a document, uh, I'm sorry, a handkerchief or something like that for an acquisition, and who has to, who has to pick it up? The borrower. So when there is a Kenyan suitor made by the borrower from an item belonging to the lender. So that means like this. I gave a $10,000 loan to Shimon. So I go here, take my gartel, and I hand him a gartel. I'm giving you this gartel that you should be able to lift it up and through that, make a Kenyan Sudar, which will empower that this loan is fully taken place. And guess what? Later, when the borrower will leave, the, 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 the two observing witnesses can write down that they observed that a loan took place and they can sign it, um, even without the consent of the borrower. Okay. This is provided that the borrower, as long as he didn't openly say or didn't stipulate that he does not agree to drafting a document. If he says, although I'm making a Kenyan suitor, but I don't agree that you should draft this document, okay, then it would be effective. But that's, that would be kind of uh, un assuming that we should think that he would make such a stipulation. But even if he didn't say, um, yeah, you can make a document, the mere fact that they saw a Kenyan suitor take place, they can document it afterwards. Very important rule. If you're going to give a loan to someone, it's extremely important that the loan should be with a document. 
and, and you should really do it, really that the borrower should sign on it. If you don't, and you have two witnesses sign on it, it's enough, provided that the, 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 the borrower uh, allowed it to take place. Preferably, you should also make a Kenyan suitor that the borrower lifts up the item and says, yes, I'm accepting upon myself, this is a fully valid loan, etc." Okay, now, the, I wanna ask you, where do we learn out the law of Kenyan suitor from? Believe it or not, it's actually a Pusik. If you look in the book of Ruth, Ruth, yeah, chapter four, Pusik seven, there it discusses this concept called Kenyan Sudar. And it says as follows, this is a Pusik. And it's talking about Boaz, okay? The story with Boaz and, you know, he's selling a field. Now this was the custom in former times, al in uh, concerning the redemption, Valat Mura. And regarding an exchange of a, of a, a, let's say you're selling a field or you're exchanging a field or an item or a donkey or a cow, whatever it is, l'kayem kol davar, to fulfill, to confirm anything. Shalaf ish nala, what would they do? One would remove his shoe, v'nas and l'reu, and he would then give the shoe to his friend, v'zos ha-tuhuda Yisrael, and this was the attestation in Israel. So what would they do? They would sell a field in those days. No, they would give money. I saying, oh, I'm gonna sell you the field for $10,000. Sure, let's do it, okay. So a handshake wasn't enough. They had to make a Kenyan that they were gonna, they, they pay the money. Let's say to, to, make, to make that the, the transaction will be effective and all the money, right? So they would, they would make a Kenyan suitor. So Boaz, I, I, I assume, right? The, so the seller, takes his, um, the seller takes his uh, sudar and he gives it to the, he gives it to the buyer. The buyer lifts up the sudar, the, the, the document, um, the, he lifts up this uh, special, uh, handkerchief or something like that. And that makes the, 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 the uh, transaction, transaction take place. Now in those days, they would do it with a shoe. Could be done with a shoe also. But people today usually just use handkerchiefs or maybe a gartel or something like that. But could be done with any vessel. In those days, a shoe was usually what it was done by. Okay. So the seller uh, would give an article state the terms of the transaction when the seller lifts up the article okay so sorry sorry the buyer gives an item to the seller and when the seller lifts it up it becomes a transaction now in regard to a loan we don't have a buyer and seller but we have a borrower and a lender so in this case the borrower um, would pick up an item belonging to the lender and so once you do that, so the transaction will take place. If you remember, we, we said in the Gemara, where was our Gemara? Our Gemara was right here. We said, Kenyan, and let's see if I can highlight, annotate, right? So, um, right, we said, Kenyan, uh, it's supposed to work, huh? Okay, now we're doing Kenyan Bifnei Shnaim, right? We say that when you make a uh, acquisition, you do it in front of two people, and then that's enough. And they can even write it down afterwards. You don't need to, and then the Gemara says, lomer kasvua. The moment you do a Kenyan, you don't need to tell them write it down because the moment there, there's a transaction, a uh, Kenyan suder, it's very strong. It makes, the, it, makes it uh, effective on the spot. Okay, very good. Let's move on. So now, We've learned the discussion of uh, subsection 10. Now let's move on to subsection 11. In subsection 11, we learn as follows. That even if a Kenyan was done, they made the Kenyan Sudar, again, the, the, the borrower made a Kenyan from an item belonging to the lender, okay? So even if a Kenyan was done, the condition is, is that in order for the witnesses to be allowed to write down that the, 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 the loan took place, and this is now they're writing it as an official document, that's only if the witnesses were designated as the official witnesses. 
by the borrower, you know, and the lender, they, they designate them. But if there were just two people observing something and they weren't designated as witnesses, then they would not be allowed to write it down because technically, well, what happens if you gave a loan in front of a bunch of people? So say each person will say, hey, we were the witnesses and they're going to write a contract. Then another two people will say, we were the witnesses, they're going to write a contract. Meanwhile, he could theoret the lender could theoretically get uh, 10 groups of two people, each giving him documents that they were the witnesses. And the guy could try to collect from different base stints the amount of the loan again and again and again, that would be a disaster. So therefore, in order for, the, for this to be effective, for them to be allowed to write it down, if a Kenyan was made, they have to say, Ruven uh, ben Shimon and Shimon ben Levi are there are witnesses and we're making a Kenyan now. So then Ruven ben Shimon and Shimon ben Levi can write down the test, um, their testimony and make that the transaction takes place. And oh, then the Alter Eben uh, subsection 11 says, and now if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask, by all means, can ask questions, but uh, I'm just going over what was discussed in general in, this, uh, in, this, in these topics. Then the Alter Eben says that if the lender waives the debt, so let's say like this, Shimon owed me $10,000. I go to Shimon, I say, Shimon, you don't need to pay me anymore. I'm forgiving the loan. So there were two people who saw this. Can they write down that they saw the testimony, that they, we testified that Ruvain had uh, officially gave up on the loan. He doesn't expect to receive it anymore. So, so waiving a debt, if the observing witnesses, can they write it down? The answer is yes. They can write it down and sign it even without receiving permission from the waiving party, which would be in this case, the lender. Similarly, if a person says to his colleague, I received from you such and such an amount on your debt, to me, the observing witnesses may write it down. They don't need to be told, go ahead and write it down by the borrower or by the lender. They don't need to be told that. They can write it down. The reason is because here, it's not like we're afraid that two witnesses will write down that he, uh, he forgave the debt. And then another two witnesses will say he forgave it. What's it make a difference if 20 sets of two witnesses say he forgave the debt or only one? At the end of the day, the amount owed was $10,000 whether 25 groups of witnesses will testify that it was forgiven or only one. At the end of the day, it was only $10,000. It's not able to be multiplied. So, so um, once he says and he waves, he's Michael, he forgives or he, he, he waves the debt in front, of, um, in front of the witnesses, they can write it down. And he can have that as an absolute, um, an official proof. It'll be, it'll be fine. Okay, now... Um, and now an interesting discussion, which is, let's say in general, you forgive a, a debt to someone. You waive your debt, you say, oh, you don't have to pay me. And the other person, I'm asking you something, it's not discussed in the Altar but it's a discussion in the post -game. And the other guy says, no, 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 I don't allow you to waive the debt. What it's I want to pay. I don't want you to forgive the debt. So in such a case, the Machin Afraim, which was Afraim Navon, who was a Sephardi post that lived in the, Turkey, Istanbul, and he later, I think about three or 300 years ago, and he made Aliyah, he moved to Yerushalayim, became a very Hashavirov in Yerushalayim. So he, he wrote a sefer, a very famous sefer called the Machna Frame. So he says, he brings a machloikis, a discussion and a debate amongst the poskim of the Rishonim, if when you forgive or you waive a debt, is it considered that you are making an acquisition to him, that he now acquired the technical money owed to him and now it belongs to him? Or, or are you just removing yourself from the money? You're saying this money no longer, I have no connection to it. In other words, he's saying, when a person waves his debt, what is the intention? Is he saying, acquire this on my behalf from me? Or is he saying, I'm removing myself from it? What difference would it make? So one simple difference would be that if you say that he's acquiring the debt from him, that will only, that will only work if he says, I agree to accept, I agree to acquire your debt from you. I agree that you are waiving it. I will acquire it from you. Now I don't owe you anything. But if I don't agree, what if the borrower says, I don't agree to accept from you the debt that I owe, I still want to pay, then it wouldn't be mochel, it wouldn't be forgiven. But if you go like the opinion that says that you're removing yourself 
from the, when you weigh the debt, you say, I'm removing myself from it. It doesn't exist anymore. So then even if the guy agrees or doesn't agree, it would be waived. So that's a discussion from the Machna front. Altreb is not going on that right now, but it's just an interesting discussion in general. Um, okay, now, so once you waive your debt, it's over. Um, the witnesses can write it down, and assuming that the, the borrower agreed to it, then according to all opinions, it would be effective, and they could write it down. Okay, let's move on. So that was subsection 11. Now, subsection 12 and 13 was about, the, about the, the original question I asked you, which is how do you make a contract halachically effective in cases when we're talking about gifts or stipulations in ways in which the, the debt or the, the, the loan or the gift or, or the, 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 the percentage of own will be a valid gift. So, so um, there is a Gemara, which we'll see in a moment which is right here, we'll see that. But before that, let's, let's go through my um, tiny introduction. So in subsection, subsection 12, and actually 13, it also moves on that same general topic. It discusses this Talmudic term of an asmachta. What does an asmachta mean? Samach means to le lean upon, somech. You lean like people who are falling, somech noflin. Okay, Shem supports the people who are falling. So asmachta means it depends on. So a person would say, I was doing it because I was thinking in my mind such and such. In other words, I wasn't really giving it to you fully, fully, unless without this little tiny stipulation in my head, and therefore I didn't fully give it to you. So later on, he'll say, oh, yeah, I gave it to you, but I didn't mean it. So then people say, the Indian giver, the Indian giver. Well, in halacha, it's possible that a person could make such a claim. I didn't mean it. So how does that, how do we get around this general problem? And you will know that all, that all contracts, if they're not done with a, you know, a very carefully wording, they could be that they don't bear any uh, absolute um, halachic uh, strength to them. So it's important that if you are making a contract with it, a loan or something, or you want to make sure with an expert that it's being done correctly. But let's be, become the experts and find out how to make a halachically valid document. So, as we mentioned, there is this Talmudic problem called an asmachta, which is even when you obligate yourself to give something or sell something, it's possible that you could later say, I didn't mean it, and I'm backing out of the deal, right? Because the person is assuming in his mind that the condition will not, will not end up taking place, and therefore the sale or gift or release of debt does not effectuate. So what do we do to avoid the pitfall of asmachta? How do we make valid documents? The Alter Rebbe brings generally three um, solutions. There could be more. The Alter Rebbe discusses three classic solutions. And then he goes on to discuss what's the common custom when people make these conditions. Uh, do, do, okay, do, do people assume that you should write them all down? You, you, the, the borrower didn't say so or not? Okay, let's see right now. In order to avoid an esmachta, there are various halachic solutions that can be done to avoid the uh, to, can be done to show that the intent is very real. One solution is to make a kinyan in front of a prestigious court. So what does a prestigious court mean? That well, means a very, uh, a based in. You go to a based in, a a I don't know how many of them there are, but there are some. And you go to them and you say, we are going to make this loan take place. We want that it should be that even though there's some sort of a condition on it, we want that it should be fulfilled and it should be literal and there's no play games, there's no monkey business in the, the, the intent. The intent is real. There's no Indian giving in this case. So the Alter Rebbe says, one solution is to make a Kenyan in front of a prestigious court. So you would give the loan or you make a, a, a sale or you make some sort of a condition on the loan or, um, or in, on the sale or on the gift. And you say like this, I'm giving you $100,000 if, if you um, uh, go to China this coming month, then I'm giving you $100,000. They makes a Kenyan and there was nobody there really witnessing it. It might not be effective. Or there was two witnesses, but there was no base then. It might not be at all effective. But what if he would go in front of a prestigious court? He says, I'm giving you the $100,000 after 30 days, provided that you go to China within the 30 days. And he does the Kenyan Sudar in front of a prestigious court, then it will be effective. Then, the, the, then if he goes, he can't say, well, I didn't think you would really go to China. Come on, nobody's getting into China right now. 
or, or some sort of more realistic um, condition. He says, I'll give you $100,000 if, you know, you finish my job, you, um, you know, you, 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 you repair my wall within 30 days. I don't know what. And, and he makes the Kenyan in front of a Chashev Abestin, in front of a prestigious court. Then if he fulfills the condition, he actually for sure can get the money. That's one way to, 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 to fight and counter the possible pro- problem of an asmachta. Okay, we don't want the person to say, well, I didn't mean it, I didn't mean it. I beg, beg to say, but you made, a, you made a Kenyan in front of a prestigious court. So then of course it's effective. So that would be one effective way. Another solution. Now the question that somebody, I was telling that to somebody when I told you the story in the beginning of the class about the guy who wants to give some, like a quasi gift to his son. So he says, I don't know, he lives, I'll just tell you, he lives in Atlanta. He says, where is, there's no prestigious court in Atlanta, what am I going to do? So I said, okay, you have another solution. So let's go to solution number two. So what's the second solution? Another solution is to have the document state on the, the loan or on the gift or on the sale, whatever it may be, that the Kenyan was done in front of a prestigious court. Now it says that in there. Did it actually take place? The answer is no. Even if it didn't take place, it still will be effective. The Alter Abbas says, this is effective even if it's not true. And the question is, why? The answer is based on this concept that when you admit that you owe something, even if it's not true, we take your word at first face value. As we're going to see, there's a Gemara, which I'm going to show you in a moment, a Gemara in Gittin on, I think it's on, yeah, 40B. We'll see the Gemara in a moment. But once he says on the document, it says, I, the, 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 the giver of the gift, have made a Kenyan in front of a prestigious court, even though he only did in front of two witnesses and maybe there was no prestigious court. But the fact that it was written and he said to write it, it's like he's admitting that he did it in front of a prestigious court. The altar says that'll be effective. So anytime you're giving a gift to someone or you want to be the recipient of the gift, make sure that it says that on the contract. Otherwise, there could possibly be ways of the guy saying, I didn't mean it, I didn't mean it, you know? So he's going to write, I accepted, uh, made a king in front of a prestigious court that this, this should take effect after 30 days if he fulfills this in this condition. Okay, and then the Alter Rebbe brings a third solution. A third solution is for the person to state that he accepts upon himself a ban of ostracism or an oath if he does not fulfill the obligation. That, that's another option. So he could say, I, the giver of this gift, will give the million dollars after 30 days if he does such and such. And if I don't do it, I will accept upon myself a ban of ostracism. It's a severe issue. So even if he doesn't officially accept upon himself a ban of ostracism, the fact that he said it and he wrote it on the contract, he told people to write it down, is as if he did. Or it'll be enough in regard to making that the, the document is not going to be an asmachta. It's going to be, it's going to be a real valid halachic document. Okay, so even if it's not really true, it's as if it is, it's as if it's, um, it's enough for these purposes. Now the Alter Rebbe then goes on in Sif uh, Yudbeis. He says, the custom is to write any wording that uh, amplifies legal power. In Hebrew, we call it yifei koach. Legal power, amplifying legal power of the bearer of the, of the legal documents. So we don't want that legal documents should be written in a way where you could contest them and say, well, look, it's not even written. It's not even a halachic star. Goodness, it was, I wasn't serious when I, when I said I would give him the $50 if he goes to the market for me. I, you think I meant this? So that's why you have to make sure that any legal document when it comes to these issues should be valid in halacha's eyes. And that's why one of these three options, which we said is either say opinion was made in front of a, a prestigious court or, or it could say that uh, uh, that actual opinion was done in front of a prestigious court. That's that would be number one. Or that he write that, it, or he writes it down that it was done in front of him. Or third option is he takes upon him a bo- an, an o a ban of ostracism or an oath if he does not fulfill his obligation. That, those would be ways of getting out of the problem to make that the document has amplified legal power. Okay. And then in subsection 13, the Alter Rebbe writes that to avoid any confusion on the established custom, because then the Alter Rebbe says, well, maybe people have in certain places, even if you don't say it, it's like everybody knows in the back of their head that this is what they meant, that the document should be a valid document. So it might be effective even if you didn't say it. 
But then the altar is maybe maybe that's not the custom of the place. So better that you should spell things in black and white. You should say that we're going to write all legal, uh, amplified legal powers on behalf of the bearer, whoever is holding the document, so that there should be no question to, on the on the validity of the document that it wasn't meant uh, sincere or not. We you should say we're going to write all these things to make sure that the document will for sure be a valid document. Okay, very important. By the way. That's also when people want to write a, a, a will to someone. We'll, we'll get there later on. But if you write a will to someone, you know, get, saying, I'm going to give to my child this money if Chas uh, Shalom passed away or so, or, or I want to give to this person or that, you need to make sure that the document is a legal, effective document because you could, it could go to Basin and say, well, he said he would give to his daughter, but a daughter doesn't acquire inheritance minotora. One of the brothers could say, well, she's not supposed to receive. He wrote a will. He just said, I'm going to give. What is this? This doesn't bear anything in halacha I'm going to give. It doesn't account. And they can go to Basin and maybe challenge the validity of it. So if a person wants to do these types of acquisitions and gifts and stuff, they need to make sure that the document is a legally, halachically binding document. Very important. And in subsection 13, the Alter Rebbe writes that to avoid any confusion on the established custom, one should explain to the person accepting the expressions of amplified legal power, the expressions will be included in the contract. He says, don't, don't take anything for granted today. You don't know what is in people's minds, maybe in, in Rhines or in Vilna, they might have had, had in their mind that the contract, when they, when they gave the loan or the gift, that they had in mind that they're going to write all these fancy expressions in the document. But maybe in... Uh, in, uh, in Mir, they don't have that in mind. And you don't know where the person's coming from. We don't know. We don't know what the custom is. We don't know. So make it very clear to the person, whoever is going to be the giver or the whatever, whoever is giving the document to the other person, that it should be very clear and explain to them that they want to write all these different expressions, which will give absolute legal power to the, the person who's bearing the document. And we'll conclude with the following. This that we mentioned earlier, that if a person says, I had made a legal acquisition in front of an a, 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 a important court, even if it didn't take place, and it's a lying, it's not even true, we'll say that it's effective. How does that work? On what precedence do we have that we can say he, he, made, it, he made a Kenyan in front of a very hush of Basin when it never took place? How, do we, how can we say that that's effective when it's not even true? So the, the answer in the Alter Rebbe's source is this Gemara and Gitin. The Gemara is on 40B. And it says as follows. I'm going to read it in Hebrew and translate. Ha'oimer nesati sada plenty. A guy says, I gave a field to so-and-so. Vuhu'oimer lo natanli. Then the guy who's apparently received this field, apparently says, he didn't give me any field. So we say, chayshin shem ezichaloy al deach. We say maybe he did give it, but he didn't, you know, hand him a document which shows that he's giving the field. Rather, he gave him a document he gave him a document, which on the document, uh, I'm sorry, he made a, gave the gift to somebody else, and you are allowed to give a gift to a third party on behalf of someone else. And that will also be discussed later in this chapter, where you can say, hey, Shimon, I'm giving a gift to my friend Ruving, and, I'm, and he's not here, accept it on his behalf, acquire this field, this document that is the owning of the, the ownership of this field on behalf of my friend Shimon. You can do that. So maybe that the Gemara says that might have been what happened, and then so that so when so when the guy says I gave a field to my friend, and he goes no he didn't give it to me, we can say he didn't know it was given through a third party he doesn't know about it fine. Then the Gemara brings another example Kasav Ibn Asati Loi I wrote the document of this field of this I'm giving a field to, and I gave him the document in his own hands I gave it to Shimon in his hands that he's going to own my field this document of the deed of my field and meanwhile Shimon is standing in front of the basin and he says he didn't write such a document he never handed me such a document so now the problem is is that if if he gave him the gift of the document but the guy says I didn't receive it so do we say he, it's like he gave him or he didn't give him. Is he, it will, who do we believe? Morris says a very important principle, and it's used very much in the subsection 12 and 13, that the admittance of uh, the, the uh, litigant is as if he had a hundred witnesses testifying on his behalf 
that the the, the, the loan took place. Or, I'm sorry, not in this case, not a loan. That the that, that 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 there was no such a gift given to him, even though it's not to his benefit. But he's saying, I did not receive this field. I did not receive this document. Do we believe him? And therefore, the Alter Rebbe is using. That's the principle that the Alter Rebbe uses also for his halach in twelve in in subsection twelve. If a guy says, I, the giver, accepted upon myself with a king and soother in front of a prestigious court that I'm giving this field to Shimon after 30 days if he does jumping jacks for me, or whatever he, condition he made, okay? So we'll say that it's effective and it won't be an asmach, it won't be like a, 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 a gift that wasn't really effect, effectuated. And and even and the Alter Rebbe says, and even if it wasn't true, we still will accept it. And why? Because it's based on this principle that when a person admits, does baldin adam dummy. When a guy admits and says, "I owe money," or "I don't receive this gift," or "I'm foregoing my rights," or it goes to him, it's like it's like it, when he says it, it's like a hundred people are testifying on his behalf. So we don't care if it's technically true or not. He admitted, he says so, so we we take it at face value. So with this. We've explained uh, the Sifim of, we learned the law, we, we discussed a little bit about the Russia, and we explained why the Russia is not accepted, and that was in subsection 7. And then we skipped on to 10, and in 10, we learned about uh, subsection 10, we learned about um, that when you make a loan and it's documented, it has a lot more strength than if it's only a verbal loan. And then, if there would be a king and suitor, even if it wasn't told over to witnesses to sign it, it's as if it's made for it to be uh, documented. And then we went on to explain a little bit about the source of king and suitor that it's mentioned in the book of Ruth in chapter four, plus six, seven, where they would take a shoe and they lifted it up in order to make the sale take place of a field. And today we don't usually use shoes. We use some sort of a garment or a, or a gartel or something. And we, we will see in the next class, we're going to talk about a vart. When the chassin makes a l'chaim, when he gets engaged, so he lifts up this uh, handkerchief of the, uh, to make that he's committing to the marriage. We'll, we'll discuss a very interesting t- discussion. What is he doing with the king and so That'll be next week, Bez Rosh Hashem, um, actually this week and this Wednesday, Bez Rosh Hashem. And then we, uh, we discussed uh, 11. We learned about... Um, that when there was a Kenyan, you have to, to make that the loan or the gift will take place, you still have to designate witnesses. You can't just take two random people because then you, if you had a room of people, each person will then write down their testimony. You could have 25 groups of people writing their testimony. That would be a disaster. However, so we, only if they were designated witnesses, they can write it down if they saw a Kenyan take place. And we said when you forego a loan, it doesn't make a difference. Then you can write it down, even if he didn't tell, designate the witnesses, just the witnesses who are there saw it, they can write it down. And um, well, even if they weren't told to write it down, they can automatically write it down. I, well, you know, if they weren't designated, they can still write it down because there's no concern over there. And then in 12 and 13, we discussed this concept called the smachta, which is that when you make a, 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 a halakhic uh, document, you have to be careful that it's done properly. And we brought uh, interesting three solutions that can be done in order to avoid the pitfalls of making an invalid document. Okay, so Bezrus Hashem, that concludes for today.